Um, welcome to the um, Politics of Women's Power panel. Um, I am Dr. Jocelyn Stitt. Uh, I am the Director of Research at the Institute for Research on Women and Gender at the University of Michigan, and I'll be moderating um, this panel this morning. Um, we will have 15 minute um, presentations from each of the panelists. Um, I will be um, stop, I will be stopping my video during their presentations, but I will come back on at the 10 minute mark. That's the best way I could think of to flag you. Um, and then at the 15 minute mark, I will stop. Um, after um, our presenters give their um, presentations, we will have questions um, at the end and I will be moderating um, the chat and queuing up people um, for our questions at that time. So as the panelists are talking, please feel free to put um, questions or comments or even just your name in the chat um, function, because that's how we're gonna do the, the questions. So I will be introducing um, the panelists uh, one at a time. Um, Liz, um, Liz Deegan is first and um, her pronouns are she, her. I'm sorry, I forgot to say my pronouns as well. My pronouns are she, her. Liz Deegan is a third year doctoral student in the English department, but her work mainly focuses on queer underground media. Her interests oscillate between cult and our camp popular culture and underground queer avant-garde cinema, but focuses on work that disrupts long-held patterns and practices within the visual world. Liz, um, if you're ready, please um, start your, your paper. Hello, everyone, and thank you for getting up early this Thursday to attend my session, or this session, it's not mine. <laughs> um, my name is Liz Deegan, and I'm a film scholar working to complete my PhD here at MSU. The work I'm presenting today is something I worked on a few years ago, so I will be interested to see if there are any ways that you think I could update it or strengthen it when we get to our Q&A portion. Um, and then a brief content uh, note, there is some mention of rape and violence towards women in this presentation. It is not um, <clears throat> graphic or thorough, but it is there. So I just wanted to make sure uh, folks had a heads up. So before I dive into my content, I like to provide a bit of a roadmap so that folks can have an idea of what I'll be covering. First, I will introduce my work, including some guiding thoughts and ideas. Then I will discuss the 1979 film, Norma Ray, addressing the discrepancies between the true story and then the Hollywoodization of the film. Following that will be a similar discussion of Silkwood and then North Country. And then to wrap things up, I will briefly talk about some documentaries and footage of picket lines that directly opposes this Hollywood version of women leader activists. And then at the end, hopefully there will be some time for questions and comments. So while the strike film is a regular occurrence in the short expanse of film history, there are few and far between that portray women's roles, let alone show women at the helm of the rebellion. Whistleblowing women or women who are willing to speak out of turn and stand up for what is right are largely ignored in these narratives. In his book about an ecological media of sound, ecosonic media, Jacob Smith refers to whistling and women by hearkening back to the proverb, proverb, whistling girls and crowing hens always come to some bad ends. And while he is referring to the whistling of women in connection to birds and sound, this proverb can be connected to the sentiment of whistleblowing and a woman's perceived role in communication. Smith says, quote, the whistling girl's proverb hints at the consequences that could follow for women who disregarded gendered norms of communication. Just as noisy hens are likely to be the first on the chopping block, so women were reminded of violence that could, that could result from being too vocal. The few Hollywood interpretations of female-led activism in the workplace make significant moves to circumvent the imagery of the persistently clucking hen to display a more socially acceptable woman even if it means re rewriting history and reimagining female characters. In order to analyze these changes in historically based narratives, I've chosen three Hollywood films, Norma Ray, Silkwood and North Country to investigate how the representations of the main female character builds a certain trope of a sad victimized woman who can't handle their activism pursuits on their own. Each film will be compared to the true stories they were based off of as well as analyzed to explore how each woman is, woman is represented. 
Following the examination of these films, I am to investigate the representations of female labor organizers within the documentaries as a counterpoint to those Hollywood films. In doing this, I will investigate how Hollywood representations of female labor activists sensationalize and delegitimize the gruesome, tireless, and proactive lives of real women who have fought for equality and safety in the workplace. So the first film I'll be discussing is Norma Ray, a 1979 film directed by Martin Ritt. This film was based on the true story of Crystal Lee Sutton that was played, uh, relayed in the 1975 book, Crystal Lee, A Woman of in Inheritance by Henry P. Laferman. Crystal Lee Sutton was born in Roanoke Rapids in North Carolina. She worked in one of the seven J.P. Stevens textile mills and was eventually fired for becoming one of the organizers in the, in the attempt to unionize the textile factory. At the time the film was released, the union and J.P. Stevens still hadn't agreed on a contract for the union workers and the mills. For the film, Crystal Lee Sutton was renamed Norma Ray Webster and was played by Sally Field, who won the Academy Award for Best Actress as well as the Best Actress Award at Cannes for the role. While Norma Ray definitely grows into someone worthy of feminist iconography, before meeting Reuben, the union representative, she is without her own agency. She plays the role of a naive ingenue who doesn't know what's good for her. It is only when he comes into town and bullies her into joining the union that Norma Ray becomes aware of how belittling her surroundings are to her. In order to open her eyes, Norma Ray needed this big city, smart city man to explain all of her problems to her. However, this is one of the parts of the film in which the facts differ. The real Crystal Lee Sutton wasn't prodded into taking part in unionization. According to a New York Times article by Maggie Jones, Sutton's introduction to the union was through a flyer posted in the mill and already, quote, had been thinking about the paltry wages, bone tiring work, and the stingy benefits, end quote. While this might seem like a small change, it is a change that requires exploration. Why can't Norma Ray find the poster and union by herself? Why does she need a male guide through the world of unions? In making this change, Norma Ray loses what Crystal Lee Sutton has, agency. Furthermore, the relationship between Norma Ray and Reuben is another aspect of the film that needs extrapolating. Throughout Norma Ray, there is a palatable sexual tension between Norma Ray and Reuben, even though both of them are in relationships. This creates a pattern for Norma Ray within the film. She begins by living in her parents' home and being under the thumb of her father. And then she gets married and moves in with her husband, who also wants to control what she does and does not do. And then the only way for Norma to question this repetitive, oppressive relationship with men is meeting Reuben, who stimulates her mind. However, this does not break any pattern. Norma Ray is still beholden to um, Reuben and is willing to do whatever she needs to do in order to help him. And if she doesn't, she's blamed. Much of the plot focuses on this aspect of Norma Ray's character. She is chided and derided by her father, her husband, and Reuben for being too independent and not focused enough on familial obligations. In the real story of Crystal Lee Sutton, the Reuben character was based off of a union representative, Eli Zivkovich. These characters varied in many ways, their age, religion, background, their jobs, so on. The choice to change this character allows for a more believable will they, won't they romantic structure and instills the idea of an outsider coming to town to save a poor community and open the mind of a young, passionate woman. Crystal Lee responded to Norma Ray by saying, quote, they made it into a Hollywood movie, playing up sex and violence. They didn't tell my story, end quote. <clears throat> Furthermore, unlike Norma Ray, Crystal Lee Sutton wasn't left to live and stay in Roanoke City forever. She followed the film's release by traveling the country, setting the record straight about her life, the union, and the film. So these fictionalized changes, while somewhat expected from a Hollywood film, are very specific choices that shift the strength and agency of Sutton to fit a more attractive, acceptable version of a woman, Norma Ray. Then with Silkwood, it's a 1983 film directed by Mike Nichols, and it follows the true story of Karen Silkwood, a labor union activist for the health and safety workers in nuclear facilities. The real Karen Silkwood worked at Karen McGee Summer and Fuel uh, Fabrication Site in Oklahoma in the 1970s and made plutonium pellets during that time. 
Eventually, she joined the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union and was the first woman to be a part of the negotiating team. Karen Solk would work for the union in trying to report and investigate issues of safety within the plant. She was found to have plutonium contamination at least three times and even had traces of plutonium in her home. Karen Silkwood died in a suspicious car accident on November 13, 1974, while driving to meet with a New York Times journalist to relay the information she had about the plant. The plant closed down a year later. Her family eventually sued the company for the plutonium contamination and won. Unlike Norma Ray, Silkwood uses the real names of both characters and companies through the, throughout the film. Karen Silkwood is played by Meryl Streep, lives with her boyfriend Drew, Kurt Russell, and her lesbian friend Dolly Cher, who, work bo who both work at the plant with her. In the film, Silkwood is at first flippant about policies and protocol when it comes to safety standards. She gets along with most of the people she work with, works with even though she has familial struggles and doesn't have custody of her children. Her mindset shifts after she has been blamed for a leak in the plant and a subsequent contamination and torturous decontamination process. Much like Norma Ray, the fictionalized version of Karen Silkwood is blamed for all of her domestic issues. Both Dolly and Drew complain about Silkwood's dedication to the union, and Dolly even goes to the lengths to accuse her of taking better care of the union than her own children. Considering that Silkwood's children do not live with her, this is a jab that resonates with viewers even after Dolly apologizes. This judgment placed upon Silkwood sticks in the mind of the viewer since earlier in the film, she is shown struggling to visit her children and speak to them on the phone. Furthermore, Silkwood, like Norma Ray, also became a tool of the union and another educated outsider, Paul Stone. Before she started working with him, she wasn't able to accomplish much of anything. In Silkwood, the three times Karen is contaminated with plutonium, they're followed each with rough and very physically exhausting decon decontamination processes. Each time the decontamination process is shown at length and with the final representation being the most severe. With each of these scenes, Silkwood is losing control of her body. While she has enough of a rein on her life uh, to be able to rekindle some of her relationships, she is consistently battling the effects of the work upon her body. Throughout the film, Silkwood slowly deteriorates. It is only when she becomes embroiled with the union that she begins to cough, look fatigued, and have an influx of contamination scares. Yes, this is probably how the decontamination and the plutonium poisoning affects the body, but the film uses these scenes specifically as melodramatic spectacles of Silkwood's pain and struggle. Having the decontamination process leave Silkwood sorer and weaker each time and showing close-ups of her face while the team brusquely scrub her down only serves as a stockpile of suffering. This suggests, once again, in order for a woman to follow activist pursuits, she must sacrifice some part of herself or her life in order to be successful. And in the same, and in the case of the film, it is clear interpretation of Silkwood's death as foul play, which was never proven in the real, uh, in her real death. It goes even further to suggest that she has to sacrifice her life to stop Karen McGee. So then with North Country, um, Nikki, Nikki Caro directed the film, um, which is based on the book by Clara Bingham and Laura Leedy Gansler, Class Action, the story of Lois Jensen in the landmark case that changed sexual harassment law. Uh, the trial, <clears throat> sorry, the trial of Lois E. Jensen versus Evelyn Takatine Co. was filed on in 1988 and it is the first class action sexual harassment lawsuit in the United States. And while this case was on behalf of Lois Jensen and 15 other female workers at the Minnesota Mine, the film primarily follows the fictionalized representation of Jensen, who is played by Charlize Theron. The character in the film is renamed Josie Ames as the real Lois Jensen refused to take part in the film. She wouldn't sell the rights to her story and she wouldn't act as a consultant on the film. But North Country follows some of the same basic tropes as Norma Ray and Silkwood. In the beginning of the film, Josie is incapable of taking care of her family and is a victim of domestic violence. Furthermore, just like Norma Ray and Karen, Josie is unable to enact change or inspire any of her female coworkers until the help from Bill, a big shot city lawyer. Again, this falls in line with the educated outsider coming into town to help fix a struggling woman's life. 
another instance in which this film fills in line, um, film falls in line with the previous two, is that it reimagines important aspects of the original story. For example, in Lois E. Jenkins' case, the class action claim was filed in 1988. But in the film, the story falls in line with the Anita Hill sexual harassment case of 1991. Throughout the film, Josie is watching the case on the television, reading about it in the news, or talking about it to her mother and peers. The inclusion of this case acts as a source of inspiration for Josie, as seeing someone else stand up for the same issues emboldens her to act. Much like Reuben pushing Norman to act, Norma to act, this shifted timeline deprioritizes the proactive nature that Lois Jenkins herself utilized to enact the significant change. Furthermore, of all of our, my whistleblowing women in this uh, presentation, Josie Ames might be the most silent of whistlers. Her voice is ignored consistently through the film, starting with her choice to leave her abusive uh, husband. Her voice makes no difference. It is only the physical pain and the loss of ownership over her body she endured in being raped that gives her any redeeming sympathy in her community. And even then, her pain has to be retold by a man for her to have any traction in, a, in enacting change. In North Country, Josie is used as a prop for the important cause, but she has no listeners or supporters. She only has people that take advantage of her story for their own gain. So I am running out of time, but I wanted to briefly mention these three documentaries, Harlan County, USA, Union Maids, and With Babes and Banners. These documentaries heavily feature women in labor activism in all levels of the union and in all levels of work. These women started as homemakers who were resistant to the idea of striking, but once they saw how poorly their husbands, family members, or fellow women were treated, they started to take action by aggressively protecting and providing for the laborers. In all three of these documentaries, a variety of diverse female labor activists or organizers were portrayed. These women are nothing like those in Norma Ray, Silkwood, or North Country. These women are rough and full of agency, unwilling to budge or be ignored, and they don't owe their strength to anybody but themselves. Uh, the documentaries show the reality of the role of women in some of the most important labor disputes in American history. Okay, thank you very much, and I look forward to your uh, questions. Let me unshare, let me stop sharing, sorry. Okay, thank you. Jocelyn, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, I didn't realize that. Um, I was saying, Liz, that was really fascinating. I can't wait for the um, discussion about those um, films and also the um, documentaries. Um, next, we have Katie Paulo. Her pronouns are she, her. Katie Paulo is a fourth year undergraduate student studying comparative cultures and politics, anthropology, and women's and gender studies. Her research focuses on reproductive rights, gender-based violence, body politics, and fat studies. Um, and Katie, um, just as with Liz, I will um, note, I will um, stop my video until the 10 minute bar mark, then I'll come back on and I'll let you know at 15 um, minutes. All right, sounds great. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right. All right. Um, so thank you everybody for show, uh, for coming to the session. Um, today I will be presenting on a paper that I've entitled Too Fat for Body Positivity, How the Body Positive Movement Fails Fat Bodies. Um, so briefly, I just wanted to give an introduction and outline um, to my presentation and what I'll be talking about today. So first, I'll start by introducing um, fatness as a social justice issue. I will move into talking about how fatness fits in with feminist discourses. Um, and then I will give a brief background to the body positive movement. Um, uh, then I will go on to uh, my thesis statement and my main argument. I will follow this with the methodology that I use to come to this uh, conclusion. I will then follow this up with the critiques that I have of the body positive movement, um, my recommendations for it, and then moving forward, what I would like to do with this research. 
So um, first of all, why is, why is fat discrimination a social justice issue? So fat or weight discrimination is based on the assumption that all fat people are inherently lazy, unhealthy, and unmotivated individuals. Um, this is also um, underpinned with the idea that um, fatness, more than other social justice issues, is a choice that people have. Um, it's a perception that has been um, shaped by the way that our medical establishment and our culture views fat bodies, and it's rate, um, rooted in um, racism and sexism. Um, something that shows the exam uh, an example of this is just the mere existence of fat people that is painted as an epidemic. Um, and life-threatening, um, as well as an issue for the population as a whole. Um, this discrimination is also heightened for those with intersecting identities, so at the intersection of gender, race, class, um, so forth. So for this study, I particularly focused on fat women, um, so at the intersection of weight and gender. Um, so there are just a few statistics to kind of ground this idea. Um, one study found that 14% of OBGYNs in Florida have a weight cutoff for their patients, meaning that they won't take patients over a certain size. Um, quote unquote, obese women are subjected to a 17.51% reduction in their wages compared to um, fat men who experience no economic penalty for their weight. Um, and then uh, male jurors were found to be far more likely to find fat women guilty in the same case as thin women. So those are just a few um, ways to show that this discrimination is widespread and throughout multiple different aspects of a fat woman's life. Um, so locating this within a feminist discourses, feminist dis uh, discourses have long noted that the body is a site of control, uh, specifically under the patriarchy. Um, but these discussions um, typically don't talk about fatness. And when they do, um, they often perpetuate fat phobia that we already have. Um, so one example of this would be Susie Orbach's book, um, Fat is a Feminist Issue, which came out in the late 70s. Um, and it talks about fatness um, as an issue for women, but ultimately it reduces them to their eating habits. And um, basically the conclusion comes to that, like, if you fix your life, then you'll be thin type of thing. Um, and some of the other stories that are some of the other um, narratives that we have are more, more personal stories. Um, and these are very important to bring into the, um, the fold and when we talk about these things. But I use the idea of the danger of a single story coined by Chimamanda and Gozi and Dice to uh, talk about how when we only have um, these personal narratives, we often essentialize women. And what we want to do is be able to get the full narrative and the full experience that all fat women face. So we don't want to um, essentialize these women further and um, just assume that they all have the same experience. Um, so ultimately, these discourses on the body largely leave out fat women and far, further marginalize those who should be centered within the movement. Um, if we want to aim for an inclusive feminism, um, we need to be able to listen to fat women um, as well as all other marginalized women. Um, so now, so now a brief introduction to the body positive movement. The body positive or body positivity movement draws on the work of fat activists and black feminists dating back to the 1960s. Uh, the modern movement took off um, or is noted to take off uh, when fat activist Tess Holliday started the campaign hashtag after beauty standards in uh, 2012. It's a social media based movement that uh, particularly emphasizes an acceptance of body diversity. Um, yet it is still, it's pretty ambiguous um, without a lot of clear demands. There's not a um, very clear definition of the movement and there is not like a large um, like organization base. It's more on an individual level. Um, this had this uh, movement is marked mostly by the hashtag usage, um, hashtags such as hashtag body positive, body positivity, um, and those sorts of things. So moving into my thesis, uh, my main argument here is that the body positive movement has done more to support corporate branding and individualized fat blame than it has to liberate fat bodies. The movement is indicative of how feminism have, has often erased the most marginalized women and allowed the priorities of the more privileged to take center stage. The movement fails to acknowledge the historical and structural discrimination that fat bodies face and thus underrepresent them. This underrepresentation is evident in the movement's prioritization of individualized approaches to self acceptance over a critique of structural inequality, the exclusion of women of marginalized social groups, and the corporate exploitation of body acceptance for capitalist gains. Ultimately, the body positive movement has to fundamentally change to advocate for fat bodies effectively. 
So my methodology, um, what I would call that I came to this um, con uh, conclusion with is kind of like a feminist post-structural uh, content analysis. So I had a specific interest in gender and um, I used feminist theories such as um, the theory of intersectionality coined by black feminists and Kim Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, I specifically critique the power within the social movement and other feminist social movements. Um, and then I used a collection of blogs, social media, content articles um, for my content. So now getting into the nitty gritty, what are these critiques of the body positive movement? Um, so first of all, I have noted that there is more of an individual focus here. The focus in the body positive movement has really been on self-love or one's own journey to discover their own beauty or self-worth. And while these are really important for mental health and for individuals, they don't focus on the racist and sexist institutions that we have that establish how we think about our bodies and how we normalize discrimination. Um, Basically, what I argue is that we need to take a more structural approach um, to advocate for marginalized bodies effectively. And this can be seen by fat activists calling for a more radicalized movement, um, things like that, that really put the center stage on those who are directly marginalized. Um, I also argue that this individual focus is part of a larger product of neoliberal feminism. So this idea that we individualize blame versus holding institutions accountable and put the onus on individual um, people to figure out their own problems. Um, the next point that I have is the large commodification of the movement. So basically, um, body positivity is often used as a marketing tactic from a lot of companies in fashion, beauty. Um, you can see on this slide here that I have an advertisement from American Eagle's Airy um, brand, um, and it says the real you is sexy, no retouching on these girls. Um, they use these types of like um, positivity and like all bodies are accepted um, to sell their brand. And what they often end up doing is this term um, that has been coined size appropriation um, and used by um, academic Downing Peters to kind of use this idea of like cultural appropriation, but for sizing um, in clothing stores, basically this idea that brands outwardly use plus size models for branding purposes, but do not actually serve fat populations. So what they do is they post, they use advertisements to promote body positivity, that all bodies matter, all this stuff, but then they only go up to a certain size. So American Eagle Airy typically only goes up to a US size 20. And we know that um, the average American woman is a US size 16. So when we put those restrictions, we know that we're leaving women out and we're not actually accounting for all bodies. Um, my final point here is that um, the body positivity movement is uh, hierarchical and white centered. So those in power typically align with Eurocentric beauty standards. Um, they're white, they're thinner, they're big where it matters type of thing like hips, breast, butt, that type of thing. Um, they typically have some sort of social and cultural capital whether they are social media influencers, celebrities, those types of things. Um, one of which that has been called out um, specifically by fat activists is uh, actress Jamila Jamil. Um, she's a leader in the movement and she is by almost all standards considered a thin woman, yet takes up a lot of space in this moment, movement um, around fat issues. So one example of which was, um, she talked a lot about removing the, the word plus and plus size. And while, um, despite whether you agree with that argument, um, my argument here is that fat women should be calling the shots on that and be talking from their experience um, about whether or not this is really what we should be fighting for. Um, and finally, women of color are often overlooked and not given credit within this movement. Like I said, um, this movement is based on the work of black feminists and um, women, black women are often overlooked and other women of color. Um, so one such example um, happened just a few years ago with actress Rebel Wilson proclaiming to be the first plus size woman to lead in a romantic comedy uh, for the film, Isn't It Romantic? And when she did this, she ultimately erased the work that black women have been doing for years in the film industry, um, such as Queen Latifah, and some other um, women who have starred in romantic comedies um, and it just ultimately erases their work. So moving on to my recommendations. Um, so my main recommendation here is a movement that centers those who are most impacted. So in this, this case, we were talking about fat women. So we need to actively work to understand the oppression that fat people face both historically and contemporarily and shift to a structural focus um, versus that individual focus. We need to be critical of our discriminatory institutions and personal biases, whether that's the medical establishment, diet companies, how we view fatness for our own bodies um, and what kind of comes along with that. And um, finally, 
you'll notice throughout this, con uh, this conversation, I've used the term fat, and I'm doing this in a kind of reclaiming manner. I am not using it in a way that um, is meant to be derogatory. I'm using it as a neutral descriptor for bodies um, and pushing away the stereotypes and kind of um, reclaiming that word um, as a fat woman myself and pushing back against these medicalized terms such as obese, um, because ultimately what they end up doing is allow for control over a fat body. So moving forward, um, so this paper was originally written for an undergraduate course, um, and it was something that I found really interesting and want to pursue further. Um, and like I said, this is a social media based movement and a lot of the publications that are out um, about this movement take place on Instagram. Um, and that might be for a, a number of reasons, um, but we do know that body positivity is still talked about on Twitter and there hasn't been much um, discussion of that. So something that I'm looking at working on um, is using um, MaxQDA, which is a mixed method uh, coding software to analyze body positivity tweets. Um, so um, what I've been doing recently is um, collecting data through MaxQDA, which allows you to import tweets you can see in this little window here, um, the picture of the window on my slide. Um, you can search in MaxQDA um, by words, hashtags, whatnot, to collect uh, tweets for up to a week. Um, so I have been collecting tweets based on certain hashtags in body positivity movement and am excited to get to coding and see what this can bring and hopefully um, bring me to a full publication at some point. Um, but that is all I have. Uh, thank you and I look forward to our discussion later. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, um, that was um, that was really interesting to hear um, critiques of um, you know the body positivity movement um, you know from a fat studies perspective. So I, I appreciated that. I could see some links with um, Liz's paper that we can talk about in the Q and A. So thanks so much for that. Um, next we have um, Alyssa Stephanie's Yates. Alyssa Stephanie Yates is a third year doctoral student in the Higher Adult and Lifelong Education, the Hale program at Michigan State University with a specialization in women and, in women and gender roles. Her research focuses on the influence of gender identity and roles on students and professionals experience in higher education. Um, Alyssa uses she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and the same with the other, um, um, uh, panelists, um, I will um, turn my video off for the first 10 minutes, turn it back on, and stop you at uh, the 15 minute mark. So um, when you're ready, please begin. Great. I think I've already set up my screen share. Um, if not, someone just please feel free to interrupt me and let me know that it's not progressing. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. My name again is Alyssa Stephanie Yates, and today I'll be presenting my paper Women in U.S. Post-Secondary Education, a Historical Analysis of Women's Students' Access. I begin my presentation by offering an introduction, defining my terms, and briefly explaining my analytical framework, in which I really highlight decoloniality, the coloniality of power, and decolonial feminism. Then I present a history of women's access in post-secondary education at specific time, uh, periods of time in history. To conclude, I outline women's current positionality in the U.S. post-secondary education system, which is a result of their storied history in the system, and ultimately, the persistence of colonial ideologies surrounding gender and race. Throughout this historical analysis, I argue the U.S. post-secondary education system disadvantages women because of their status as other when compared to the ideal, which is embodied by white, Western, or Euro-American Euro men. The, sorry, let me just turn to my next slide here. Thank you. Um, the United States post-secondary education system is predicated on the idea that education is necessary to achieve the American dream. However, throughout history, different social groups were excluded or provided limited access to the system to ensure social reproduction of those in power. Women, both white women and women of color are no exception. Yet post-secondary education's role in strategically excluding women in order to reproduce social positionality and maintain the coloniality of power is largely disregarded in current histories of the higher education system. 
So it's important to note, I utilize seemingly traditional gender categories in this presentation. Uh, you'll often hear me say men and women, which seems to adhere to the gender binary. However, through the assistance of decoloniality and decolonial feminism, I really recognize the problematic nature of these terms and of the gender binary. For example, Lagones, a decolonial feminist scholar, argued that these terms limit the human experience and disregard individuals who do not fit into the binary. It also disregards indigenous groups who recognized other gender categories. Despite the terminology utilized in this presentation, I do not see gender as a byproduct of biological sex, and I support the understanding of gender as a continuum rather than a binary. I continue to utilize the terms men and women in order to tap into the present shared understanding of these words, and as a result of the limitations of the English language, which fails to offer other options with the same widespread understanding. With regards to terminology, I also utilize the terms white women and women of color to distinguish between women as a social class. I recognize that women of color is still a collective term. However, I utilize it to capture the varying experiences of women based on their racial identities, and it includes Black women, Indigenous women, Latina women, biracial women, and others. So next, I want to talk about my analytical framework. Um, first, decoloniality. Decoloniality is a continual process that involves questioning westernized rationalities, ways of thinking, seeing, and ways of experiencing the world, which are largely considered the only way or the truth. For this presentation, decoloniality allows me to question the foundation of sexism and racism that were constructed and upheld by European ideals of Christianity, whiteness, and masculinity. Building on decoloniality, the coloniality of power allows us to understand the formation of power dynamics, which originated from the European colonization of the Americas and involved the social construction of racial and gendered categories or classifications. Europeans created racial groupings to differentiate between themselves, who were the colonizers, and the other, who were the colonized, and to really rationalize their domination over those they colonized. Gender was also at work within the colonial system and coloniality of power, which Lagones explained through decolonial feminism. In fact, gender classifications and gender power dynamics originated prior to the development of race. Similar to the development of race, which was created to label non-white people, the gender category of women was created to label people who did not physically appear as men, with men being a placeholder or synonym for human. Women were grouped together based on them being quote unquote non-men. Essentially, the colonizers created and imposed a new dualistic gender system, which we contemporarily refer to as the gender binary. The gender binary created a patriarchal hierarchy of power that positioned white men at the top, stripped indigenous women of their social positionality, authority, and rights, solidified heterosexuality as the quote unquote only legitimate sexuality, and supported capitalism. Furthermore, the gender binary is raced, which means that it is applied differently to white women and women of color because of their racial classifications. In considering this analytical framework, one can see that post secondary education has been implicated in colonization and westernization from its very establishment. For example, the oldest institutions in the US, colonial colleges, were constructed through the physical labor and economic benefits of slavery. These colonial colleges also participated in an attempted epistemicide of indigenous knowledges and ways of being. Overall, the ideal image of a post-secondary education student was, and in some ways continues to be, quote unquote, white, Christian, heterosexual, and without disabilities and women, by nature of their gender, could never and will never fulfill this unrealistic ideal. Based on popular histories of U.S. post-secondary education, women, regardless of racial identity, were completely overlooked until the mid-1700s, when white women began to have some involvement or presence in the system. Um, sorry, I just lost my spot here. Um, some involvement in the system. Specifically, religious institutions began to be developed for upper class white women to learn homemaking, child rearing, and religious education. Many of these institutions eventually expanded their curricula to offer bachelor degree pro uh, programs and provide women for quote unquote socially acceptable roles, such as teaching and missionary work. While white women were beginning to gain some access into the system, 
Um, they originally were excluded because they were only valued for their biological capacity to continue the white race through childbirth. However, providing women a curriculum that focused solely on their ability to fulfill expected societal gender roles really appeared non-threatening to both the coloniality of power and the gender system, which I argue is one of the only reasons that women were first allowed to enter the system. Although more institutions focused on the education of white women in the mid 1800s, the US society remained hesitant to the idea of an educated class of women because they might reject their social position, become unfit for motherhood, or worse, reject heterosexuality, which was the very foundation of the gender system. The US as a nation state and its subsequent society was really concerned with white women and other groups, particularly people of color, transversing the established social order and rejecting the coloniality of power because it would likely result in redistributing power away from white men and delegitimizing the nation's claim to lands and unpaid labor of people of color whom they had no right to. During this same time period, uh, initially white women and later women of color gained access to previously established post-secondary education institutions, which began the co-educational movement. The co-education movement was in part motivated by the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862, which established state-sponsored education and really increased educational access for women beyond the upper class. It, it made higher education more affordable and it uh, established MSU, as we know, as a pioneer land-grant institution. The establishment of co-educational facilities and greater college access for white women was met with strong resistance from white men on campus who really disliked the competition that they were receiving from women. In comparison, women of color remained largely excluded from post-secondary education, um, but also from published histories of this era. Despite my best attempt to create an intersectional decolonial history of post-secondary education, there is absolutely no documentation of women of color accessing post-secondary education prior to the Reconstruction era in 1870, which followed the U.S. abolishment of slavery and the Civil War. This exclusion of women of color from both the system and the literature seems intentional and a mechanism of the persistent colonial systems of gender and race. In erasing women of color from history, colonizers draw attention away from the U.S.'s colonial imperialist history, which involved the exploitation of lands and people, again, that they had no claim to. So the aforementioned co-educational movement was a precursor to the quote unquote golden age for US colleges and universities, in which the general public became really fascinated with the characterization of higher education and the opportunities it supposedly offered. This historical period was also known as the progressive era and was the first time in US history that the presence of women became somewhat commonplace on college campuses. While white women were enjoying the greatest level of access and admittance to college in history, women of color, particularly black women, were being restricted from higher education by men belonging to their same racial identity groups. The occurrence of men of color working to further marginalize women of color is a mechanism of the colonial gender race system, and it serves as evidence that uh, the colonial gender race system really persists throughout US history. The golden age led into World War I and then World War II, in which women, both white women and women of color, experienced unprecedented access to higher education. I posit women's high level of access in this era was a result of a number of factors. First, the nation and society was really preoccupied with war, so they were not as concerned with limiting women's social positionality and autonomy. Basically, they were distracted. Second, the nation needed women to ensure the financial survivor of higher education institutions by filling seats and maintaining enrollment levels while men were away at war. So by only allowing women access out of wartime necessity, I argue women were still being exploited for their physical labor and their economic value, which reflects the persistence of the coloniality of power and the colonial modern gender system. The years following World War II again limited women's access as women were really pressured to leave institutions. So as soldiers were returning home, our colleges and universities couldn't uh, serve them all, especially because they wanted to utilize their GI Bill benefits. So it was deemed unacceptable for women to take up one of these limited seats. As a result of this pressure, women were forced to return to the home, which effectively controlled their physical movement, autonomy, physical independence, and secured the heteronormative familial structure. The Cold War era only intensified this difficulty by perpetuating the patriotic ideal 
that it was a woman's responsibility to cultivate a home environment that would shelter her children and bolster her husband, which again mirrored the role of white women in the colonial system. Women's limited access and position in post-secondary education remained largely stagnant until the passage of Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972. This piece of legislation allowed more women to not only enter college, but also have the legal protections to challenge inequities on campus. It is largely regarded as the document that laid the foundations for women equality in post-secondary education. However, women's experiences since 1976 highlight that equality remains outside our grasp and as a result of the continued power and influence of our gendered and raced system. Although it is often assumed that women of all racial identities have achieved gender equity in higher education because they currently enter the system and graduate at higher rates than men, women continue to experience limited access to and persistence within prestigious institutions and particular fields of study. For example, women make up less, less than 50% of enrollment at selective institutions, despite scoring higher on standardized admission tests than men counterparts. Women are also less likely to be admitted to graduate programs than men. Additionally, highly selective and prestigious institutions tend to offer more programs in areas that women are unlikely to pursue, rather than offering prestigious programs in academic areas in which women tend to enroll. And women's um, tending to enroll in particular fields is really pressured again by society and our schooling systems. Women's concentration in less prestigious institutions, particular fields of studies and careers, ultimately limits their social mobility and curtails their autonomy, which again maintains this coloniality of power. Women also face bias, sexual assault, harassment, and violence on US college campuses based on their gender and racial identities. This can all be traced back to the coloniality of power and the gender race system in which women, particularly women of color, were seen as sexualized objects for men's enjoyment and exploitation. This over-sexualization and abuse of women's bodies continues to curtail women's movement, physically and socially. By limiting women's access to post-secondary education, those in power who embody colonizer identities continue to control women in an attempt to limit their social mobility, autonomy, and political power. So here are some of my references. And thank you all so much for listening. Please feel free to contact me if you'd like to discuss this or other topics further, I'd really love it. And I'm happy to engage in our discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, that was a really um, comprehensive, but also incisive overview of uh, women's education in the US. Um, okay, next we have um, Sen Kim. Um, Sen Kim uses she, her, hers pronouns. Um, she is a fourth year doctoral candidate in the English department. Her research interests lie in 20th century African American literature. Her research examines how 20th century black literature offers a creative and critical account of femininity. And um, send the same as the other um, speakers. I will um, stop my video for the first 10 minutes, come back on to alert you, you have five minutes left and then signal at the end of your time. Um, so please begin when you're ready. Um, so I don't have any slide to share, so I'll just read my paper. And um, the title of my paper is Horton's Pillars, Repairing Black Women's Power Through and Against Psychoanalysis. And before I start reading my paper, I also want to give you a trigger warning. My paper examines Horton Spiller's critic of how the history of enslavement in America engendered black bodies and its ongoing legacy. So in my paper, I quoted several languages from Spiller's article, which demonstrate how brutally the slavery system operated. So now I'll start reading my paper. Psychoanalysis is a theory that helps examine how the subject should moderate and repress one's desire to situate one's place in the social order. By demonstrating that libido, which is also called sexual drives, controls our behavior, Sigmund Freud founded a psychoanalysis. Freudian psychoanalysis provides us a framework to grapple with the mechanisms of a range of different difficult emotions and psychs, such as hatred, guilt, obsession, and hysteria. Freud sees the slipperiness of language as one of the symptoms of the operation of what is repressed in the unconscious. 
And Jacques Lacan highlights the operation of the unconscious through the language by theorizing the imaginary and the symbolic. Lacanian psychoanalysis argues that an infant can feel jubilant completeness and unity at the mirror stage, epitomized as the imaginary field. However, one begins to repress one's desire as entering the field of language, which is named as the symbolic. In Lacanian thought, each stage is gendered. The symbolic is characterized as the law of father and the masculine, while the imaginary is characterized as feminine and often fantasized to provide complete attachment between a ba baby and a mother. Lacanian psychoanalysis is based on our assumption of a traditional parental function and children's growth, trajecto growth trajectory within the Western nuclear family structure. In demonstrating how the enslavement history under which enslaved people were, quote unquote, robbed of the parental right and function, Horton's pillars in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe shows that the psychoanalysis could be used to pathologize Black family, and she further reflects on how to critically use psychoanalysis to unpack and elaborate on Black women's power and femininity. Horton Spiller's Mama's Baby and Papa's Maybe closely examines how the history of enslavement ungendered Black bodies and destroyed Black family structure. The Moemian Report, which was published by an American sociologist, Daniel Patrick Mohemian, in 1965, is the epitome of how American society pathologizes Black femininity. The Moemian Report diagnosed that the role of Black father is absent in the Black family. Without addressing the fact that the enslavement, enslavement institution and um, following unjust economic system banished the Black Father's Law, Moinian accused Black women of debilitating and threatening Black male roles in the Black family. In debunking the Moinian report, Spillers maintains that we should need a new grammar which can enable us to justly understand, um, justly and fairly understand Black women power and appreciate them as social beings. To scrutinize the significance of Spiller's critical theory, it is important to note that the subtitle of Mama's Baby and Papa's Maybe is an American grammar book. In my paper, I examine how Spiller thinks through quote unquote grammar, which references the symbolic. Grammar is an important concept because it exposes what types of body is captured in the grid of gender and named with the vocabulary of humanity. Spillers argues that enslaved people were situated as quote unquote, zero degree of social conceptualization. In other words, the slave trades, stri uh, the slave trades stri stripping of bodies from black people made them reduced to quote unquote, flesh as zero degree of social conceptualization. It is important to note that zero does not simply indicate nothing, but it denotes specific value, which can be falsely made to appear as nothing. According to Spiller's slavery system registered black flesh with quote unquote wounding and their bodies um, continue being misnamed with anti-black monikers in America. In this regard, I interpret that Spillers illuminates how the construction of American history and civilization does not just erase or exclude black bodies, but grammatically exploits them. This is why Spillers states that, I describe a locus of confounded identities, a meeting ground of investments and privations in the national treasury of rhetorical wealth. My country needs me, and if I were not here, I would have to be invented. From here, Spillers indicates that black bodies are not excluded but mistreated or reduced um, um, are not excluded but mistreated or reduced as a quote unquote vestibular to construct American grammar or of gender and sexuality. In other words, the notion grammar elucidates how black bodies were made to be silent but not absent in the American society. Interestingly, 
rather than creating a new set of vocabulary to discuss Black women's power and femininity, Spillers works to forge a, forge a new syntax which allows to examine the complexities of Black women's desire and power in America. In her article titled Interstices, A Small Drama of Words, Spillers maintains that Black women are the beached whales of the sexual universe, unvoiced, missing, not doing, awaiting their verb. In Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, Spillers proposes that Black women should on their own terms be able to reclaim their linguistic and epistemic rights for their gender and sexuality. To do so, first, Spillers underlines that enslavement history categorized enslaved people as a property that made Blackness related to quote-unquote stillness or fixed in time. In the American Encyclopedia of Slavery, um, Black bodies are quote-unquote anatomically specified and categorized in association with non-human objects like a quote-unquote laboratory prose. This process of reducing Black bodies into objects is accompanied with uh, ungendering their bodies. Slavery, slave traders distinguished Black people's sex into uh, sex to quote-unquote quantify their body sizes in the slave, slave ship. The inhum inhumanity of ungendering can be clarified when it is compared with Judith Butler's discussion of gender and sex. In Gender Trouble, Judith Butler insightfully explains that gender and sex are not disparate categories and further argues that our understanding of sex is influenced by how we perceive gender, femininity, and masculinity. By contrast, sex differences of Black people in the slave ship are determined without any notion of humanity nor gender, but are based only on their quote-unquote scaled inequalities. The ungendering of Black bodies results in reducing enslaved people to flesh. More, moreover, the grammar of sexuality of Black people under the enslavement institution is transposed into sensuality. As a consequence, sexuality of Black bodies operates as the projection of white slaveholders' desire to hold power in the society, which in turn undergirds anti-Blackness inherent in America. With hiding the fact that the enslavement history prohibited black blackness and black bodies from finding its proper place in the American grammar, anti-black social order misnames the black female sexuality and femininity. To work against this unjust and unfair American grammar, Spillers underlines the significance of a new syntax and verb for black women rather than proposing a new name for of Black women in power. This is why in many other articles, Spillers examines how Black fictional characters unpack and build the complexity and dynamics of their femininity and sexuality through their interaction with other Black women characters and family members. In my interpretation of Spillers' um, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, grammar and the symbolic reflect um, Spiller's refusal to perceive Black women's subversive power as an unconscious or sublime presence in America, and I instead find it as a social power. The uh, importance of Spiller's indicating the symbolic can be highlighted when we read it side by side with Judith Butler's Gender Trouble. Butler theorizes subversive power can be invoked through um, parodic enactment of social science. Butler's discussion is solidified in her critique of Julia Kristeva's creative taking up of Lacanian psychoanalysis. By proposing a semiotic where we can reconnect with the imaginary field, even after learning the social language, Kristeva suggests that poetic and rhythmic language, different from social language, can bring us back the affluence that the social system does not allow in the symbolic. Kristeva, in other words, urges us to channel with the complete and affluent sense of imaginary. 
Connecting with semiotics can give us a sense of re reuniting a with a mother because poetic language can recall what we as an infant felt when physically and emotionally staying intimate and close to the mother, according to um, Kristeva. However, Butler unpacks the risk of Kristeva's theory, which fantasizes maternity. According to Chris, uh, Butler, Kristeva posits that femaleness is external to the cultural norms by which it is repressed. Here, Butler does not agree with the theory which places femaleness exter external or exterior to the cultural logic. Um, Butler critics that um, the danger of finding a rebellion outside of the symbolics, no matter how finite and delimited social signs are. Um, similarly, I think that Spiller's claiming for reconstructing grammar through her critics of psychoanalysis resists perceiving black bodies and desire outside of the American grammar book. However, Butler's parodic usages of um, parodic usages of social symbols cannot be applied to black women's rep reclaiming of epistemic rights. According to Spiller's, black people are ungendered in the space of slave ship and middle passage, which is romanticized through the pronoun she. And this shows black people have a lack of parodic ground for resignification and recontextualization of social signs. Moreover, as Theoban um, Somerville in Clearing the Color Line points out, the anti-black history of passing and blackface in racial performance, parody, uh, racial parody cannot be an effective tactic for black women to expose the originality and imitation. While Butler and Spiller's approach share similarity, Spiller's also clarifies that theories which does not address black history and the afterlife of slavery cannot effectively discuss black women's gender. So um, this is a conclusion. So my presentation today shares what I, what I analyze about the importance of Spiller's thinking on black women's power through the social symbolics and grammar. And my future project will further scrutinize how we can reconfigure American grammar where black women's femininity and power can be justly discussed. So this is end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, and it was it was just wonderful this morning to hear um, you as um, a graduate student taking up one of um, the most important articles, arguably, <clears throat> sorry, of the uh, 20th century um, spillers, um, 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 mama's baby, papa's maybe. So that was just fascinating. Thank you. Um, for our final paper, we have um, Juliet Gazetta. Um, she uses she. Um, her pronouns. Juliet Gazetta is jointly appointed as assistant professor in the Department of English and the Department of Romance and Classical Studies at Michigan State University, where she teaches courses on theater, performance studies, and film, as well as Italian language and culture. Her book, The Theater of Narration, explores a form of contemporary solo theater in its historical, political, and performative dimensions and will be published by Northwestern University Press in the summer of 2021. So, Thank um, you so much. Julia, you can start when you're ready. Okay, y'all can hear me, right? My tech never seems to work. Okay, good. <laughs> um, first off, this has been really fascinating. Um, I'm really happy to be a part of such a great panel. Um, I'll try to go at a quick clip so that we have time for conversation. Um, my title I haven't been happy with, but it's Equality Strike Through Towards a New Practice of Social, of Societal Structures, the Evolution of Elena Ferrante's Protagonists. And it should probably include something about sexual difference theory, as you will see. Let us conclude this quest for equality, equality with those who created the supremacist structures that have rigidified our practices of living our capacity for experience, growth, and contribution is not the ideal to which we aspire. The novel coronavirus pandemic of 2019 has forced Americans to see wrenching inequality and indignities. That the scaffolding with which everyone else tries to build equality with the cisgender white man is flimsy is no surprise to many of us. 
It is one of the main reasons why Elena Ferrante's novels have sold millions of copies around the world with their depictions of poor and middle-class women from Southern Italy who confront their hardships within the oppressive structures of society and yet fall short of triumph. Ferrante's protagonists, all female, are often on the verge of a profound insight about when and why and how their lives and their mother's lives unfolded in the unintended ways that they did. They know intuitively that something systemic, structural, and largely out of their control was at play in their design. I am interested in how Ferrante's works through, how Ferrante works through and builds upon a single question in her entire oeuvre of fiction, from her very first novel in 1992, L'amore molesto, which is translated as troubling love, though that adjective molesto connotes a more specific trouble than we get in English culminating in the two protagonists, Elena and Rafaela, or Le Nu and Lila, as they call each other, of her nearly 2,000-page tome known as the Neapolitan Tetralogy, published from 2011 and uh, through 2014 in Italy. Ferrante's characters contemplate how to shift the existential experiences of women so that they can more fully realize their potential as thinkers, as actors, as part of a shared narrative in which they had more, in which they had more say in its design and structures. Her characters, many of them writers, struggle to devise a strategy, but as they prod their personal histories against local and national ones, they perform a number of practices offered through the Italian theory of sexual difference, formed through debate and discussion at the Women's Milan Bookstore Collective and the Diottima Group in Verona in the early 1980s, following the lead of art historian and feminist thinker Carla Lonzi, who in 1970 wrote her influential invitation in the manifesto Sputiamo su Hegel, which is often translated in its imperative, let's spit on Hegel. But the performative relevance of its present tense is also worth noting, not just let's spit on Hegel, but we are spitting on Hegel. As early as the 1970s, when Lonzi was writing some of her most influential texts, some of Italian feminism moved away from the paradigm of equality and towards a variety of theories and practices that aimed to allow the meeting of theory and practice to flourish. A politics of equality, many thought, separated theory from practice to the detriment of feminism, but more dangerously, it promoted the continued entrapment of women in male design structures that importantly are both societal and personal. Over her oeuvre, Ferrante embraces, develops, and also alters a number of fundamental aspects of difference theory, especially bringing them alive in the performative realm. Like Lonzi's title, she enacts them in several extratextual performative gestures in the tetralogy in particular, even while performing and a confrontation with performance is a recurring theme in her first three novels. Simply put, Sexual difference theory is a strategy that enables critique of male systems and also offers a counter practice to those systems, not as an antidote, but rather as a blueprint for new ones. One of the most prolific philosophers of Italian difference theory, Luisa Muraro, states plainly that, quote, sexual equality is not a feminist goal, end quote, because it endorses male models, really white cis male models, that everyone else is told they should aspire to instead of criticize and create alternatives. Muraro wants to practice a politics of relations, which turns away from a politics of rights-based equality and creates spaces like the Milan Women's Bookstore Collective, which is an actual physical space, but opens up a literary and philosophical tradition created yeah. by women. Instead, uh, indeed, one of the objectives of Italian difference theory is constructing a canon of women writers. Key to understanding difference theory is to understand the balance between theory and practice in a symbolic domain. In some ways, sexual difference is a misleading term because the difference in sexual difference does not relate only to biological sex nor only to gender and its cultural dimension, but it is a symbolic difference. It refers to a different production of reference and meaning that originates and continues to develop via embodied experience and knowledge. 
This idea to turn away from an attempt to attain equality is something that especially intrigues me right now in this moment in this country, because it is so much in conversation with Black Lives Matter protests and ongoing work in critical race theory. So I wanna be clear that advocates of Italian difference theory do not dismiss the ethos of equality, but as Lanzi put it in Sputiamo su Hegel, equality, I'm quoting, equality is a juridical principle, what is offered as legal rights to colonized people and what is imposed on them as culture, end quote. Certainly in the US, we see how the law treats people differently. In fact, quoting Simone Weil in its original 1987 Italian publication, the Milan Women's Bookstore Collective warns its readers not to be duped by the illusion of legal parity when the very title, with the very title of their important theoretical text, which they call non credere di avere dei diritti, or don't think you have any rights. In the 1990 English translation, the choice to emphasize theory over practical advice resulted in the title, Sexual Difference. So as I continue to work on this project, I'd like to put some of these ideas in conversation with Black feminist thought since I see intriguing similarities. Uh, Sylvia Winter, for example, uh, ideas on reframing might come to mind. Angela Davis's own balance of practice and thought, as well as uh, her readings of oppressive systems, more recently in abolition as a response to systemic violence. Our own colleague here at MSU, Ruth uh, Nicole Brown's performance-based work in community as a site for knowledge production. And finally, Audre Lorde's warning that we cannot use the master's tools to dismantle his house are perhaps the most obvious. In fact, I was startled to read another major thinker of Italian difference, Adriana Cavarero's 2002 essay titled Who Engenders Politics? Uh, her assessment of feminist theory in the early 1990s finds, uh, is finding itself in a position of, quote, dismantling the master's house using his tools to borrow a wise and inarguably just saying, end quote. So in the essay, she's trying to find a way out of what she sees as a clash of essentialist and postmodern feminist thought. I think it'd be really useful to go back to Lord in 1979 um, and other Black feminists. So Cavarero is also indebted to Hannah Arndt's work, and in, the, in that essay, um, the, uh, the Who Engenders Politics essay, she emphasizes the construction of female subjectivity by focusing on the idea of who-ness, arguing that we know who we are and who others are through narrative and the agency to construct our own life stories. There are multiple answers to the question of who, and there should be space for those variations. Obviously, she developed this from her big 2000 and book, Relating Narratives. This idea of constructing our own stories and identities brings us back to Ferrante. In her earlier works, three slim novels published in Italian in 1992, 2000, and June 2006, her protagonists have psychological and emotional breaks with society as a result of trauma, death, divorce, and motherhood. They struggled to find their way back from these crises, particularly since those events were not themselves the sites of trauma, but rather the catalysts. In Troubling Love, Delia returns home to Naples, so in Ferrante, all roads lead to Naples, to help with arrangements for her mother's funeral. And as she investigates what had been termed a suicide, she painfully revisits the story of her own youth as she watched her mother withstand frequent and vicious abuse by her husband, but also an example of independence in her work as a seamstress, her pursuit of an extramarital affair and eventual divorce. Olga, the protagonist of Days of Abandonment, endures a process of mourning, anger, deep reflection, and eventual reframing of her own life choices uh, when her husband leaves her. The choices uh, in which she refer differ to her husband's career and needs, and still it was not enough for him or their supposed storybook life in Turin. More than investigating her own choices, however, Olga, like Delia, is interested in the moments when she made them. Why was the practice of deference and sacrifice the patterned road for her? Already here in the first two novels written a decade apart across the 1990s, when difference theory was prominent, we see the impulse of the protagonists to recreate a new genealogy for themselves that would alter the structures in which Delia's mother might never have drowned and Olga might have had a different life altogether. 
By Ferrante's third novel, The Lost Daughter, the reader meets a protagonist who has acted on some of the questions about different choices that they and Olga pose. And again, uh, as how troubling doesn't exactly do justice to molesto, lost is gentler than oscura from the Italian La Figlia Oscura as the title, which connotes a darkness and confusion. So when Leda was in her mid-20s, she languished in the solitude and isolation of motherhood, the inability to have space and time for her own thoughts. This is like my pandemic life, by the way. Uh, the alienation of her own desires, both uh, physical and intellectual. When she returns to school to pursue a doctorate in literature, it is not long before a senior academic in England takes an interest in her work and her, inspiring her to leave abandonare her family in Italy for three years before she eventually returns. So this decision that no one ever speaks of haunts her. And in reflecting upon her life, she says, quote, I had been a girl who felt lost. This was true. All the hopes of youth seemed to have been destroyed. I seemed to be falling backwards towards my mother, my grandmother, the chain of mute or angry women I came from, missed opportunities, end quote. Still, we have yet to meet an example who was able to break this chain successfully and lead a more satisfying life. Finally then, Elena and Rafaela from the Neapolitan Tetralogy are the ultimate experiment of Muraro's politics of relations. Elena takes the hard one equal rights road, oppositional to difference theory, offered by a society that is raising its consciousness about gender and class disparity and making accommodations by forcing opportunities into the structures that were built by and for men. Elena wins encouragement from her teachers, eventually scholarship, studies at university. Lila, on the other hand, stops studying early, uh, marries in her teens. Her brilliance, however, uh, isn't that she could write before other children, was a voracious reader, developed thinking even as she was forced out of school. Her brilliance is existential and that she always carves a way to live on her own terms despite continual corporeal and emotional punishment. She succeeds, Lila, in subverting the patriarchy even as it constantly brutalizes her. In its most vicious attack, the disappearance of her daughter, she begins to theorize a link between performing and conjuring, the act of coming into being, the act of beckoning, enticing, remembering, or imagining. Leela's eventual disappearance is an act of physical, indeed metaphysical, transformation that mimics her daughter's state of being, of vanishing. Her disappearance, not a death, symbolizes her final and absolute refusal of the patriarchal systems that she had always outsmarted. It also speaks to the continued absence of a model, a strategy for women to live on their own terms. So in my concluding paragraph here, all of these characters chip away at a historical, existential, and biological otherness that begins to rebuild a narrative, if not structures, that stem from the female imagination. Literary scholar Tiziana de Rogatis has written, quote, difference is also a point of view, a means of constructing new categories of perception through which to rewrite contexts that are only apparently unrelated, end quote. Pointedly distancing from the pursuit of equal rights, which are rights defined by within and for male tradition, the theory of difference celebrates female positive values and reflects the need for a female genealogy. Ferrante defines her characters as women who don't submit, quote, instead they fight and they cope. They don't win, but they simply come to an agreement with their own expectations and find new equilibriums, quote. Actually, I think equilibriums of Delia, Olga, and Leda remain quite threatened. And even while Elena presents an alternative to the traditional family, she still operates within a greater patriarchal structure that Lila disdained and continually subverted. Ferrante's characters don't win, but they invite their readers to take up a philosophical, symbolic practice of relation, and also to spit on Hegel. They have already begun to do so. Okay, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I think there were two questions in the chat, um, and I am going to weave those together with um, a kickoff question um, for all of our panelists. So for this first question, maybe while people are gathering their thoughts, if you could try to limit your response each to about uh, one to two minutes, just to make sure you have time to get more questions from the um, audience. 
Um, so I really liked how Liz kicked us off um, thinking about Chimamanda Adichie's, um, you know, well-known TED talk as well as essay um, about the dangers of a single story. Um, and so I've used that to weave through some ideas that I think potentially connect all of the papers and maybe you could just expound upon um, for about a minute. Um, so Liz, I saw that relevance really in thinking about these kind of unitary representations of women in the labor struggle, especially um, with the outsider coming in. Um, for Katie, um, and I think this also brings in Anna um, or Anna Pegler Gordon's question for Alyssa, but to start with Katie, um, the idea of um, the single story is this individualized social struggle. Um, and then there was also a question about um, positivity versus justice. Um, and then for Alyssa, the single story I thought is that women have achieved educational parity, which is, um, you know, true in a limited sense, but uh, the single story there would be about white women. Um, and then Sen, um, you know, I think you really touched on the universality of, of Spiller's um, challenges to the universality of femininity and of the patriarchal gender structure and even of gender and sex itself, um, which is one of um, her brilliant moves. And then um, Juliet, um, I saw you really working um, against this sort of idea of there's a single story about how women can achieve agency um, and equality and um, also um, this tension in feminist theory about how we can um, construct useful praxis that will make that possible. Um, so maybe if we could just kick off with that to just um, maybe just briefly one minute and then we can get to some other questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, I did want to say that it was Katie who brought that up, not me, um, even though I probably should have. But the single story um, for my with mine, I think it that's really the problem, right? Like if we just had one uh, film that maybe like messed with the biographical story or the true story, you know, we kind of expect that. But the fact that it's a pattern over three different films about labor activism with women leading them, that's the problem, right? It flattens the differences, it flattens those nuances, and it completely strips a lot of these women of agency, which as we all know, when you do this type of work in real life, you need that agency to keep you going. You need that kind of drive from within yourself. But within all of these films, the drive is constantly uh, being placed upon the women as external forces. So um, thank you, like, I think that that's really, the, the repetition of that stripping is the real problem rather than just maybe like one crappy film, right? Like, but for it to continuously happen, for Hollywood to continuously try and reshape these women, of course that had to happen. Um, uh, I think that's the main problem. So yeah, that's kind of my little spiel and we can pass it on to somebody else while my dogs continue to bark. Katie, do you wanna go next? And I'm sorry for misattributing um, your quote to Liz. My notes are messy. No worries. I'm sorry. Um, what was the question that you had posed to me, Jocelyn? Oh, um, just about, um, I think there was also in the chat, there's some interest in um, one about the way in which um, kind of the, um, the, um, the movement um, f for, um, I guess, fat rights has been co-opted by an individualism. Um, so people wanted to talk about that. And also someone also had a question about um, um, the historical context of obese. The word okay, obese. Yeah, so um, I think, yeah, Liz's question first started with this idea of um, the difference or um, fat acceptance and liberation as a step up. I think that that's definitely, yeah, I think that's the case. So one of the arguments is really just like centering and naming the, those that are most oppressed. And when you call a movement fat acceptance or fat liberation, you're using that stigmatized term and centering those people in the movement. Um, now there are definitely issues with the fat acceptance and fat liberation movements. Um, they have tend to be pretty white. Um, a lot of it was started um, 
by men. Um, so there's been sexism in those spaces as well. Um, but I do think that it does take a like more radical approach to this idea of um, being equal dis despite body size type of thing. It, it, it takes a more structural angle and takes a more activist angle than um, a passive uh, individualized approach. Um, and that's really what I think, like I said, it's really important that we have these indiv individual mantras of self-love, um, but ultimately it's not gonna push back on our systems that perpetuate this um, discrimination. Um, and on the historical aspect, while I'm not sure when the term, I think the, the word obese came into use in the 20th century, but I know that the medicalization of fat bodies specifically starts with like the more medicalization of bodies in general in the 19th century. Um, so I know that the, it kind of, it starts a lot with the history of the BMI um, and how that was originally meant to be an indicator of um, like an overall population. Um, it was not done in a systemic way as a lot of our medicalized terms from that time were. Um, and now it's been appropriated and used for individualized uh, use, which is, it just, there's a lot of problems with BMI. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it, it does kind of align with a lot of the uh, other historical movements that have used medicine to control bodies, right? Because a lot of this medicalization came up at the same time. So same thing with like forced sterilization and birth control um, as a way to control bodies. Um, and then this concept of positivity. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of the ways that the body positive movement tries to like depoliticize or like avoid politicization is this individualized positivity approach. So if they're just saying everybody should love themselves, they're not taking a political angle. Um, whereas demanding for justice or demanding the end of discrimination is a far more political act um, and has it can, uh, it can consequence those who are making those demands. Um, so I think it's like the safer option. And it's also an option that allows people to perpetuate fat phobia. A lot of um, the body positive narratives are like, well, you know, everyone should love themselves unless you're, you know, X, Y, and Z, unless you're so many pounds type of thing. So it's even like exclusionary in that type of, we're going to accept everybody unless you're unhealthy. And those perpet those standards of healthiness are also weaved into our uh, medical establishment, our ideas of health from sexist, racist roots. Um, so yeah, I can pass That's great. On. Katie, I just want to make sure everyone else gets a chance um, yeah. to... Um, answer a question. I'm trying to, I guess at this point, because we just have a couple minutes left, um, the panelists, if you want to um, answer the question I posed, or I'm trying to see if there's questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so maybe do Sen or Alyssa want to um, talk? And then I, it looks like Julia is having a chat <laughs> Q&A. Sure, so I can jump in uh, to answer your question, uh, Dr. Stitt. Um, thinking, yes, women technically, numerically, have um, reached and exceeded gender parity in higher education in the U.S. Technically, there are more women identifying students in the U.S. higher education system than there are men identifying students. But you have to really look at where are these women being enrolled and what is their success level. Women are really... Um, concentrated in community colleges and in less prestigious or selective institutions. And we need to look at why is that the case? Um, also looking at what fields of studies women are often kind of really pressured into joining um, as opposed to some of um, the quote unquote more prestigious careers in our society, the ones that earn um, more money or are more highly valued. We know teaching, nursing, caring careers are less valued by society. And that's where we tend to see more women. Also, again, you bring up, yes, the danger of the single story, particularly with white women. That was a challenge that I had throughout doing this historical analysis. There really is so little out there on women of color and almost nothing on indigenous women and their presentation in higher education system. That's why I wanted to take a decolonial approach to it because that in and of itself is something that decolonialism can highlight for us. Why are indigenous women not represented in our higher education system? Perhaps because our higher education system is inherently violent to indigenous peoples. And that's something that we haven't really discussed as a field, as a higher ed scholar. Um, I'm also not a historian, I should clarify that. 
So in some of my interpretations, I'm coming again from a higher education student affairs lens rather than a historical lens. So I do make some assumptions or guesses as to why different groups or different stories are not included in the history, um, just because that, that's what I can do from my perspective and from the theory's perspective. Um, but I'm always looking, so hopefully I can build this as, a, as more comes out. Even a new uh, history of women in higher ed just was released over the summer uh, since this paper was written. So perhaps there's some more that I can include in here. Thanks. Um, I'll keep my response very short. So like, you know, to me, like, you know, what I wanted to do is, um, I just, I also wanted to show that like, you know, um, Dr. Judith Butler, who is sometimes often criticized for disregarding like, you know, the race, like, you know, the um, element of aspect of race. Um, but I don't think that like, I think that she is also um, troubling the like, you know, the stable or seamless category of women. So I think that what she is doing is very, really important. But so I also want to show that Spiller's thought also shared the similar revolutionary theoretical frame that Judy Butler does. But at the same time, I also want to show some distinction of the um, difference between them, you know, um, 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 Horton Spiller shows that how the, uh, the history of enslavement um, historicizes black bodies in a very distinguishing way. Um, so I think that considering or addressing the, uh, the history of enslavement is really important to think about black gender and sexuality. And one thing that I am really interested in while like you know, that I want to do further when I am developing my idea is that kind of you know um, comparing what Butler says about undoing gender and what Spiller's um, criticize and you know, critic of like you know the ungendering of black bodies. So I'm just wondering the difference between. That's fantastic, Juliet. Do you maybe want to um, be? Um, I'll try to say something real quick because um, I didn't get a chance to answer Jotsna's question, which I really appreciate um, about uh, is this kind of like a global theory. Um, and I think in a way it is, I, you know, what I wanted to just mention was this practice of entrustment, it's called a fidamento, coming out of sexual difference theory, which is about um, again, this politics of relations and sort of creating relations, building a genealogy, really just kind of like women learning and making their own histories. Um, and again, in this symbolic realm, so kind of assigning, there's this whole like symbol of the motherhood. So it's kind of assigning a trust and entrustment to another woman. And it's, you know, there are hierarchies, but they kind of embrace that, you know, like we don't have to be threatened by hierarchies and we shouldn't be threatened by difference. It's actually very um, welcoming of difference, which is also what brings me to some of the black women theory, theorists that I wanna um, further explore who also work with notions of difference among women and, and not being afraid of that, but welcoming that. Thank you so much, Judith. That, that has given me um, a lot to think about um, with sort of the equality versus difference debates, um, but extending that into um, um, Italian feminism, which I'm not as familiar with. Um, so thank you so much to, to our panelists for coming, um, just virtual applause. Um, and thank you everyone for coming to um, this panel and I hope you enjoy the rest of um, the conference. Thanks so much.